Right, we are reading from Genesis chapter 29, from verse 31, which is on the 32nd page of Bibles. All right, Genesis chapter 28, verse 31. When the Lord saw Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah had become pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. For she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again she conceived and when she gave birth to a third, uh, when she gave birth to a son, she said, "Now at least my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons." So he was named Le uh, Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, "This time I will praise the Lord." So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. Then Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children. She became jealous of his uh, sister. So she said to Jacob, give me, give me children or I'll die. Jacob became angry with her and said, am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? Then she said, he is, uh, here is Bilhah, my servant sleep with her so then she can bear children for me and I too can build a family through her. So she gave him her servant Bilhah as a wife. Jacob slept with her and she became pregnant and bore him a son. Then Rachel said, and then Rachel said, uh, God has uh, vindicated me. He has listened to my plea and give me a son. Because of this, she named him Dan. Rachel's uh, servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, I have had great struggle with my sister and I have won. So she named him Naphtail. Then Leah saw that she had stopped having children. She took her servant Zilfah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Leah's servant Zilfah born Jacob a son. Then Leah uh, said uh, that God is fortune, uh, so she named him God. Leah's servant Zilfah bore a Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, how happy I am. Then woman, uh, the woman will call me, uh, will call me happy. So she named him Asher. During uh, the harvest, Reuben uh, went on, uh, out in the fields and found some mandrake plants, which he brought to his mother Leah. Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, wasn't it enough that you took my husband? Will you take my son's mandrakes too? Very well, Rachel said. Um, he can sleep with you tonight in, uh, in return for your son's mandrakes. So then Jacob came into, uh, so, the, so then Jacob came uh, in from fields. That's everything, mm, sorry. <laughs> the fields, uh, that's, everything. Uh, Leah went out to him to meet him. You must sleep with me, she said. I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he slept with her that night. God listened to Leah and she became pregnant and bore Jacob a fifth son. Then Leah said, God has rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband. So she named him Isaac. Is a char. Leah, ser, uh, Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, 
God has presented me, presented me with a precious gift. Then uh, that time my husband will treat me with honor because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulon. Sometime later she gave birth to a daughter and named her Din Dinah. Then God remember, uh, remembered Rachel. He listened, uh, he listened to her and enabled her to conceive. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my uh, disgrace. She named him Joseph and said, my, uh, may the Lord add to me another son. Thank you so much, Zenia. I mean, can you give her a clap, please? Because that was, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. It's, it's one of those passages when you're reading, it's quite full on, isn't it? There's a lot happening. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure you felt it as we were reading, you know, this statement comes to you, what on earth is going on in this passage, right? What on earth is going on? But before we get into it, let us pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who helps us to understand your word. Please speak to us and help us to learn from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, like I say to you, the first thing that probably came to your mind was, wow, there's a lot of things happening in this passage. What on earth is going on in this passage? You know, which is a very fair question. And personally, I like mystery movies, right? When you've got to piece the pieces together of a puzzle as the movie is going on. And this is what's happening in this passage here. There's a puzzle, but the pieces are all over the place. And I like it when, as the movie is going on, you begin to make sense of the picture and you think to yourself, ah, so that's what's going on. In a nutshell, I've just confessed to you that I probably like Sherlock Holmes, right? I think probably one of the best movies <laughs> that has ever come out. And then the spin-off, Enola Holmes, who I think, personally, she is better than her brother, Sherlock Holmes. I absolutely love her. But that's up for debate. <laughs> so what I want you to do right now is maybe to do a bit of a spoiler alert, because obviously, as we're piecing this puzzle, when you get a puzzle, you know, you actually have the little picture with what it should like, look like in the end, right? So here's a spoiler alert, right? This passage is actually about a promise-keeping God. Specifically, the passage is about a compassionate, generous, and merciful God who keeps his promises and accomplishes his gracious purposes even through sinful people and messy situations. I'm going to say that again. This passage is about a patient, compassionate, generous, and merciful God who keeps his promises and accomplishes his gracious purposes even through sinful people and messy situations. I mean, you can't miss it. The passage is messy. There are a lot of things happening in there that make you think, what is happening? Why is it even there in the Bible? But we need to break it down so we can see God's bigger picture. And the first thing we learn already, as you can tell from this passage, is messy people hurt each other. Messy people hurt each other. Take a look at me and just look at the beginning of the passage. It starts off in uh, chapter 29, verse 31, and it says, When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Right there, right at the beginning, we already see messy things happening. There is a wife who is unloved. That is a deep problem. But the problem doesn't actually stop there. In fact, her wound of being unloved is so deep, her children are named after her pain. If you open your Bible, you actually look at the footnotes in your Bible, and you see that the name Reuben sounds like he has seen my misery. Imagine your name naming you that because of her pain. Does it stop there? No. Simeon comes along, okay? And if you look at verse 33, it actually says, she conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord has heard that I am not loved, he has given me this one too. So she named him Simeon. This is a woman in pain. 
And considering that childbirth, you know, happens, and then you probably have to wait another nine months for another child, she's still in pain. And then look at the third son, Levi, verse 34. And again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. This is a very desperate and sad situation. But this is what happens when messy people are unloving towards each other. Messy people, when they're loving towards each other, they cause misery to each other. But another thing is happening here. These two sisters, one is now having children. The other one looks at the other sister and says, well, why is this not happening to me? Chapter 30, verses 1, begins with this very interesting statement. When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So there we see the next thing. Messy people are envious and abusive towards each other. So in her jealousy, she decides, well, if I cannot have children, my servant can have children for me. I don't know how you felt when you heard that being said, but that is pretty messed up. That is actually usury. But that's exactly what happens here. I can't have kids, so have kids with this one. So there we go. We've got messy people who are unloving towards each other. We've got messy people who are envious and abusing each other. Then we also see the selfishness of messy people. If you look then again at chapter 30, verses 14, it reads this. During the wheat harvest, Reuben went out into the fields and found some mandrake plants, which he brought to his mother Leah. Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you take my son's mandrakes too? Very well, Rachel said. He can sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. Okay, hold on. What on earth is happening here, right? First of all, we've just seen that a wife has just sold her husband for the sake of something called mandrakes. Can you see what's happening here? Messy people are already selfish, and they don't mind what they do to other people. For those of you who might be wondering, what on earth is mandrakes? Okay, I had a bit of to do a bit of research on this one. So in those days, Mandrix was a bit of an aphrodisiac, right? Or also for women, it was something that they thought could help them give birth or be fertile, right? So it was medicinal. And so Reuben goes into the field, sees this plant, goes like, oh, mom wants to have kids. So I'm going to get it for mom. So he takes it to his mom, but obviously, you know, Rachel sees it as well. and goes like, oh, can I have some? But then a very weird exchange happens. Leah retorts angrily and says, you know, wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you take away my son? Too? There's something weird happening here. You can already tell that in this household, the relationship is so broken, it appears that the marital rights are held by one wife so dearly, so deeply, that she's got the power to actually sell her husband. This is all messed up on every level. So, what we've just learned in this first part of the passage is this. This is not how we treat each other. This is not how we treat each other. These things hurt God. These things hurt people. These things hurt society. So when we see this polygamous broken family, when we see the favoritism that is happening, when we see the envy and jealousy, when we see the resentment and hostility, when we see the abuse and usury, this is not God's plan for family. It is not God's plan for society. But something amazing is happening in this passage too. Remember, this passage is about what? A patient, compassionate, generous, and merciful God. A God who keeps his promises and accomplishes his gracious purposes even through sinful people and messy situations. So the second thing we learn from this passage is this. Messy people matter to God. Messy people matter to God. So as we were beginning to read from chapter 29, I hope you noticed something very important there. The Lord is mentioned. That's God himself. Now, obviously, in the passage, God has been mentioned a few times with the wives thanking God for various things. But if you paid attention to the passage, some of the things these wives were thanking God for 
Even you had questions like, I'm not entirely sure God did that because of that reason. But thankfully, the writer of this passage tells us three times exactly what God is doing. And those are the three times we need to pay attention to because they help us to understand the love and the mercy and the grace and the goodness of God even in this messy situation. So the first thing we see is in chapter 29, verse 31, and it says, When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive. So already there we see that messy people matter to God. And that is because God sees messy people and he helps them. God sees messy people and then he helps them. And that is reassuring that even in our own mess, God sees us and he still helps us. The next time we see God being mentioned for what he's actually doing is in chapter 30, verses 17. And this is what it says. God listened to Leah, and she became pregnant and bore Jacob a fifth son. So there we see the second thing that God does. God listens to messy people, and he helps. Isn't that wonderful? In our mess, God doesn't despise us or throw us away. In fact, he sees and he helps. He listens and he helps. And the third beautiful thing that we see about God is found in chapter 30, verses 22. And it says this, Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. Oh, praise the Lord. God remembers messy people. Or another translation would say, God pays attention to messy people, and then he helps. In all three occasions, God sees messy people, and he helps. God hears or listens to messy people, and he helps. God remembers messy people, and then he helps. And this is very important for us. We see a caring God. Why? Because remember, this passage is about a generous, compassionate, merciful God who keeps his promises And fulfills his gracious purposes even through sinful people and messy situations. So I've repeated that a few times. You're probably thinking, why is that so important that you keep on saying the same thing? And what exactly are the promises that God is even keeping in this messy passage? For us to actually understand the promises that God is keeping, we actually have to go to the past. Because you see, we are now in chapter 29 and 30 of Genesis. But somewhere in the past... God made a set of promises to somebody called Abraham. And those are the promises he's keeping here. And we need to understand the significance of the promises. Why is God still being good to the human race, even in this messy situation? So let's go back to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And let's read these words and realize two important promises that God is keeping in this passage. And this is what it says. It says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So here we see a promise that is being made, but then obviously some people might ask, so what is the link between Abram and Jacob? So here's a bit of family history. Abram was the father of a guy called Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob, who we see in this passage, who in this passage has been given a number of sons. Those that have been born. We've heard the names, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Dan, Judah, all these boys have been given to Jacob at this moment. Why? Because at this present moment in time, God is now doing something that he promised a long time ago. If you're following the the, the story, you'll be thinking to yourself, well, God, you promised Abraham a great nation, but I don't see it happening because the next person who comes in line is just an Isaac. Then the next one is just a Jacob. How is that a great nation? Well, here it begins. Because you see, the boys we see in this passage many of them will become the founding fathers of the nation of Israel because one day Jacob's name will change to Israel and they will become the children of Israel and the nation of Israel through them. So in this part, God is beginning to keep his promise. I will make you into a great nation. 
But we can't stop there because there is a bigger, better, and more powerful promise that God is on track to keeping, a promise that we are grateful for today. Why? Because God is a helping God. We've seen that. God wants to help the whole of humanity, not just the people in this passage, all of us. God saw a problem in the human race, and God had a bigger plan. And for that plan to be fulfilled in these words, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, God had to do something. So, comes our third point for tonight, and another spoiler alert. Messy people need God's ultimate help. Messy people need God's ultimate help. So the question we must ask is, when we look at the messy situation and the messy people in this passage, why are they so messy? And the Bible tells us the answer. Messy people are so messy because of sin. That's one of the big things that is actually coming out of this scripture. There is a lot of sin happening, and the results and consequences of sin affecting the people in the passage. And that's the problem that also plagues the whole of humanity. And God saw what messy people struggle with. God listened to our groaning because of sin, and God remembered his promise that he will bless all of us one day. To help us understand the weight and the problem of sin, I'm just going to take us to what we teach our kids here above bow when we talk about sin. We say to them, sin stands for this. S, shove off God. I, I'm in charge. And N, no to your ways. Now, when we say that, many people feel like, no, nah, I don't do that. But actually, you need to understand the breakdown of what sinful activities are like. Then you think to yourself, oh, maybe that might be me. Because in Romans 3.23, it says to us, for everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glory. We all habitually and at many times push God away. We all say we are the masters of our lives and at some points, we actually say, oh, God, I know the right thing to do here, but ah, there's something much more fun about me doing it this way, my way. So sin plagues all of us. And so when we think about it carefully, when you think about the list of the things happening in the passage we've read, jealousy, strife, unhealthy competition, hatred, all these things are things and maybe emotions we've felt ourselves and have gone through. So suddenly, probably we're not as different as we thought to Leah, Rachel, and Jacob in this passage. We tend to do the same things that they do. And in a way, if we thought to ourselves, God, you need to do something about this messy situation. Well, God needs to do something about us as well. The Bible says, the wages of sin are death. And that creates a big problem for everybody, including you and I tonight. But there's something beautiful about God. God has never left us hanging. So when you look at Romans 3, verse 23, you must never stop there. You must go further. And then you must see that God is doing something remarkable. Because you see, there's verses 24 to 26. And there we find that we meet, first of all, our problem. Our problem was in verse 23, which was this. Everyone has sinned, and we all sh fall short of God's glorious standard. Then God stepped in and helped, and this is what he did. And this is just the bullet points of what comes next. Yet, in his grace, God makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus Christ. God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for all our sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life and shed his blood for them. God makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Oh, praise God. We are not left in our mess. There is a Jesus that God gives us for the forgiveness of our sin. So then suddenly, there is hope for the whole of human race. 
And that's the thing that God was keeping a promise to. Spoiler alert, maybe for the future. The fourth son born to Leah, when she finally said, I will praise God. Let's just read that together. So this is Genesis chapter 29 and verse 33. It says, she conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. She said, and she called his name Judah. Then she stopped having children. And the word Judah actually means praise. When she stopped focusing on her pain and focused on God, she had this son called Judah. For those of you who have been Christians long enough, you probably are starting to get excited because we know Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. Incidentally, that's his great, 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 great granddad. So Jesus is actually in this promise that has been fulfilled already. It gets exciting because God is keeping an important promise. God is going to help the human race through Jesus Christ. And yes, indeed, all the nations of the earth. Look around, look around you. We were praying in Ukraine today. All the nations, I'm from Zimbabwe, Makatiko, that's just saying hello. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you, Abraham. It's happening, it's happened. We are living testimonies of that. But you know what? Let's just be honest about the human condition. Jesus has become our ultimate help, but Jesus knew that the problem of sin will not leave us. So he does something even better. He says, hey, I'm going to send you a helper because I know that sin will always be a problem. So I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. So when God is completely loving, messy people, he not only sends Jesus, but he then gives us the Holy Spirit. So Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to help us live morally right lives. And I'm going to make us fall into another scripture to help us understand what is happening here. Because we need to understand the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives as well. And so we start with our problem. You see, when you read this passage of scripture, it starts off by saying this in verses 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraftcy, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Have you taken a look at that list? Have you seen that actually when you look at that list, there's probably something you and I do that is on that list? Which shows us that actually we still have got a problem with sin. And something very strange looks familiar about this list. This list has got a couple of things that are very familiar with the passage we read this evening. Oh my word, it turns out sin was a problem for them in a big way, and they were hurting each other, and sin is a big problem for us still, and we still tend to hurt each other as well. God knew this problem. But thank God he never leaves us there. Thank God he never leaves us there. So we might look at our world today and we think, you know, we have a list of things we could rattle out that are problematic, linked to this list. Look at the world around us. It is messy. I'm going to tell you a few things that happen in our world, and I want you to think about them. And then we're going to discover God's solution for them. So what do we have in this world happening right now? We have things like gambling. We have things like sex trafficking. We have things like unjust wars. We talk behind people's backs. We like to buy cheap stuff and not ask how was that made. We hurt the people that we don't like. And incidentally, we also hurt the people that we do like. We tell lies to get what we want. And then we justify our bad behavior. It sounds a lot like Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. So you see, God in his grace doesn't leave us there. Because you see, that same passage in Galatians continues. Praise God, it continues. It goes on to verse 22, and it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. To make it clear to us that if we want to become overcomers of the human condition, we can't do it on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. Now, obviously, many Christians know this list and love this list. It's a great list, isn't it? Good qualities. Things that you look at there and go like, oh, I wish that was me for that, that, and that. Or things that you look at and go like, oh, I wish that was him. Or I wish that was her for that, that, and that. A few months ago, my daughter and I were reading this passage. <laughs> and we came to this list. And I looked at the list and I was like, oh, I've got an idea. Dear daughter, if you were to pick three things from this list, which three things would you like God to help you with this week? And what shocked me, what I found surprising was she was quick to name three things. One, two, three. And I was like, wow, that's quick. But what was funnier was the fact that when she said the one, two, three things that she said, I was like, yeah, I agree with you. You need help with those. <laughs> <laughs> so let me give you something to do this week. Because we all need things that need to be improved in our lives. We all need something in this list. But we can't achieve them all. It's not possible, right? So I'm going to give you a few moments just to look at that list. Just nine things, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Pick three that you think, God, I need help with those. Just pick three. And regularly this week, every day in the morning when you wake up, say, God... Please help me with one, two, three today. What's yours? Is it love? Is it joy? Is it peace? Is it patience? Is it kindness? Is it goodness? Is it faithfulness? Is it gentleness? Is it self-control? Pick three. Every day this morning, just go like, God, please help me with these things today. Make it a simple prayer. Don't make it long. It doesn't have to be. Just say, Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help me today to be kind, gentle, and have self-control. Those are my three. What are yours? So what have we learned today? Let's recap and let's come to some sort of close. We have learned that messy people hurt each other and they can't help it. It's sin within us. We find it attractive. It pulls us in. So we are messy but we can't help it. Praise God, however, that messy people matter to God and he graciously works in us and through us. And then finally, messy people need God's help and that whole help has got a name and the name is Jesus. So how should we respond? Well, let's take a moment and think about it. We must confront the truth and accept that we are messy people and often hurt each other. We then must allow ourselves to express gratitude to God that despite our messiness, we matter to him. Oh, praise God for that. We matter to God. And then finally, we must humble ourselves and run to God, run to Jesus, run to the Holy Spirit, the only one who can give us the ultimate help that we need. We run to God acknowledging that we cannot help ourselves, but neither forgiveness that is found in Jesus, and we need the daily help of the Holy Spirit. As followers of Jesus, as we reflect on the broken family drama of Jacob, we need to remember that we need Jesus and the Holy Spirit to help us live lives that are loving and caring towards our families and those around us. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus in this place today, thank you for joining us. But let me just be honest with you. None of us, not you, not I. None of us can overcome sin and its messiness on our own. It just can't happen. We need God's help. And we know his name now. God's help is Jesus. So consider bringing yourself to Jesus and go like, help me with this. I'm going to invite us to pray, but I'm going to do something brave. <laughs> I'm going to say out the prayer and I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me. That's for everybody. This is a prayer of us inviting Jesus to help us. 
Because you see, remember, God saw our problem. God listened to us. And God remembers us and gives Jesus. It's amazing what he's done for us. So I'm going to say this prayer slowly and you can repeat after me. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I'm sorry I don't always do what is right. I believe you died for me. I accept your gift of forgiveness for my sin. Please come into my life. Help me to live wisely. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.